And welcome to episode seven of the Brood Sages, Stormbound Players with a head for the game. I am Freeloader, and with me, as always, are my co hosts, Sabaiku and Arthas. Sabaiku, how is it going tonight? Fantastic. And Arthas, how are you doing? Well, I've been watching a lot of anime. <laughs> We're clearly doing great. We are the Brood Sages. And as a reminder, you can always contact us at Brood Sages on Twitter. And for you old folks, our email address is thebroodsages at gmail.com. Now, guys, uh, I'm very excited about this episode. And I know, you know, I guess no podcaster should ever say this is the most mediocre and whelming episode we've ever produced. But we have a really special treat that Arthas has brought for us tonight. Before mm-hmm. we get to that, however, I would like to just ask everybody how their weeks were in Stormbound. So, Sabaiku, how was your week? My week was pretty good. I did buy some packs for the first time in a little while. I wanted to broaden my library, so I started spending some gold there. And then, uh, unfortunately, a combination of some good cards cards in the shop and uh, fusion stone quests instead of gold quests left me a little light on gold so i didn't get to go too deep into the brawl i managed to scrounge up the gold and uh, grind the ladder enough to get to the pack but not to the fusion stones oh dear which is a shame because i do like the frostling brawl this is actually a pretty fun one but overall gained some rank and had some fun and that's what's important. Arthas, I would normally ask you now how your week was, but with uh, <laughs> knowing the gift you've brought us tonight, I want to keep our listeners waiting just a little longer. So I'll say that my week <laughs> my week was, uh, I did make fusion stones as usual, and I agree this is actually one of the more enjoyable brawls. I played it as a rush aggro winter deck, um, so I didn't get uh, too high in mana cost. I topped out at six. I also got some gorgeous cards, uh, three different commons for uh, Shadowfen in the shop. So now suddenly for 42 fusion stones, if I can uh, uh, dig up some gold, I am ready to level up to five my dubious hags, helio troopers, and lime limbs, which has me rather excited for the end of season rewards. So hopefully in November, I am beating some people up with some heavier cards. Now, Arthas, how was your week? Well, my week has just been uh, basically focusing on grinding gold. So unfortunately, I have missed out on like three brawls now where normally I would go for the fusion stones, but I simply don't have the gold because I'm busy upgrading cards. Like uh, I recently got my Reign of Frogs to level five. It's actually insane. They need to nerf that card. (laughs) 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 They need to nerf it. It's too strong. And then not just that, I've been playing mobile now because I'm basically forced to, although I love the PC Steam version. It's just that, you know, the gold income on Steam... It's literally like only half as much as what you can get on mobile. I'm wondering, like, when are they going to like fix that? You know, at least bring it up to like 15 or something. Do they have the, uh, (laughs) it's a a good question. I'll, I'll, I'll ask Joza that uh, next time we interview him. I'm wondering if they even have the ability to do that or if steam regulates that. We don't want them to incur too many losses, you know, at the same time. So, but yeah, it's just something I've been dealing with. Uh, I get to play on my on my phone while looking at some uh, casual YouTube videos at the same time. So that's what I've been doing. Just missing out on Brawl, but I am upgrading lots of cards. And anything else? <laughs> we have a very interesting interviewee for this episode. We have the one and only legendary MKM mod of the Discord server, streamer, and popular content creator of the Stormbound community. We have an interview conducted by myself and i hope you guys enjoy that one and here we are guys we have our guest here mkm hello everybody (laughs) and so mkm is a pretty well known member in the stormbound community but uh before we get into that mkm what first brought you to Stormbound? And like, how did you find about it? Uh, well, it's a pretty long time ago already. Basically, I started playing Stormbound one month before the global release. So that's like three years and a couple of months. And well, I started it because I was looking for a job and I found Paladin Studios and they were creating Stormbound. And well, what's a better way to prepare for a job interview by playing their games? I was guessing. So I was just uh, started playing the game. It was still in soft launch during that time in the Netherlands. So well, I was like one of the first to have access to the game as well. So it was a lot of uh, fun. Yeah, and, and I uh, started working at Paladin and from that point on, I just kept playing it for fun and for work. Oh, so you didn't even like start off with like, oh, this is a cool game that I want to play. You started off with, oh, I, I want to join like Paladins? Yeah, yeah that oh, okay. was basically it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. 
And um, wait, so how that was like three years ago, you said, right? Yes. So you've been playing ever since. Yeah, <laughs> done my daily grinds every day. And uh, well, see all kinds of meta, see all kinds of people and uh, experienced it like on different levels because while well, working on the game, but also playing the game as a sidekick, what well, is uh, w- two different kind of worlds colliding sometimes. Oh yeah. But uh, well, it's a lot of been fun and now, uh, Without Paladin, but with Sheepyard as new developer, I can just solely focus on enjoying the game as a player. <laughs> All right. So, um, I mean, since it's been a long time now, what, what do you think was the best time to be playing Stormbound? Like, what is your favorite time period of the game? Uh, I would say two times. I would say the basically the global launch. Since then, the game was very pure. And, well, now we have a lot of cards. It becomes a bit more complicated. So it will be a bit more harder for people to join in. But on the other hand, during the launch, the game was like completely unbalanced and (laughs) well, well, like all the polish that have came afterwards wasn't there. So yeah, it was a very raw diamond, so to say. So if you want to join the game right now, then you should join at this moment. (laughs) <laughs> and most likely every time there will be a new update you should join the game because well every time the game just gets a bit more polished the first time user experience get improved and the balance becomes way more solid like no silly op cards are in the game anymore like mm-hmm. we can complain about cards right now but in the past there were like really op cards that were so completely broken yeah it's very interesting to like um explore through the change log in stormbound kitty <laughs> about yeah. the, the particular cards like it really uh shows some very interesting changes that they did <laughs> yeah did you saw the one with the uh, gift of the wise uh oh i remember that it used to draw a card <laughs> well it used to draw two cards <laughs> It was basically oh zero mana, gain three mana, and draw two cards on max level. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I was uh, watching some of your uh, videos before, you were like, uh, oh, there's there's no reason not to play this card, even though you're <laughs> like at 20 mana, because drawing card is just that good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always a win condition, or not win, but always good. Oh man, the winter days. <laughs> yeah. And the... Like if Reckless Rush or he would have lived, like there was like the Restless Goat card, one mana, six strength, two movement, and only dealing one damage to your own base. Like things like that, that would never see the day of light anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, re- I'm really happy that those days are over as well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So MCAM, since you are a recognized member of the community, we also, a good few of us, like a good chunk of the community, know that you actually stream like on Twitch and stuff. Yes. Um, About that. How did you get into streaming and um, what do you enjoy about it? Well, how I, let's first start with how did I uh, started streaming? Well, basically for, started with my YouTube channel. Uh, I remember in the old days, you had like Dansu and the Popular Eagle who were making videos. Well, Dansu also did comment at it and he was a bit more higher level. And the Popular Eagle was way more casual. <laughs> and I was like, well, I just miss people playing like really scaled uh, high level games. And, well, I was always going from work and from work back to home. And I was playing Stormbound in the train. And, (laughs) well, during playing, I was, for my work, already recording all my matches. But this was, like, for testing purposes. But in the train, I was just playing to get better and grind and get a better collection. And I had really great matches. And I was like, well, I don't see anyone playing these kind of matches on YouTube or anywhere. So I was... Like, well, I know how to record everything. I know how everything works. I know the game. And, well, let's just start uploading my recordings. Well, my first recordings, if you go way back in my channel, are just silent videos of me playing on a a mobile and then having some fun. And then people started to commentate, like, ooh, nice plays. And, well, why are you doing this? And why are you doing that? And I was like, well, I can start explaining in the comment section why I did those (laughs) certain decisions. But then I thought like, well, it's just way easier to just commentate when I'm playing. So it evolved into giving more feedback on that point. And eventually it was like, well, why not just start streaming and uh, go all in? Oh, what, what's your favorite like uh, parts about streaming though? Like what do you enjoy the most about it? Well, the most I enjoy is just the interaction with people. Like I'm just playing, I'm just chilling. And basically people are watching, enjoying themselves as well. Give feedback on my plays or... Well, what I like the most is people suggesting decks or uh, do you want to do this? Do you want to experiment with that? So I can help them out a little bit. I think I like that the most. 
And a side note is if you are streaming, you don't have to edit stuff. And I really don't like editing stuff for a video. So it's <laughs> just it's like, like, well, <laughs> it's done when I'm done with streaming. All right. Now let's go into the Discord server. And everyone knows how uh, significant the Discord server is in the Stormbound community. And uh, so let's start with um, when was the Discord server created? Who started well, it? was it? a long, long time ago. I wasn't there when the Discord server was created. But that was like the start when the whole Stormbound uh, was created, the universe. There was also a Discord server, and most likely, uh, I think it was a collaboration or something with uh, Arano, like the old designer, and uh, Congregate, the old publisher or team member of uh, Paladin Studios, collaborator. Yeah, basically a couple of months before the global release. Okay, okay. Um, so for the people who may not be familiar with the Discord server or Discord in general, uh, what is the Discord server? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, what is the Discord server used for? Well, the Discord user is, has different uses. Basically, it's a really, really nice place for high, enthusiastic people of the community to interact with each other. And I think that's the, like, the highest prio of the server is, like, that's how I met you, right? Like, I really like Stormbound, you really like Stormbound, and we like to talk about Stormbound. And then you have a place to meet and find similar minds. I think that's really important. And what I really like about Discord as well is the interaction with the developers. So in the past, it was Paladin Studios and they gave a lot of feedback or like uh, previews on what kind of updates they will be coming and try to get some feedback before submitting those changes into the game. And now you will also see that with Sheepyard where there's like a dedicated community uh, manager who's just focusing on the interaction and help everybody out as well with bugs and feedback and help them also around it uh, communicating them with each other. Like with the latest update, they have like the community tab. So they created links to the Discord, to the Reddit and to their Instagram and Facebook. So hopefully more people will uh, mingle with each other, but hopefully also more people will come to Discord, obviously. All right, so interesting enough, um, if you guys don't already know, MCAM is actually a mod on the Discord server. And so uh, we're curious to see uh, what's it like on um, being a mod. What are your responsibilities? How did you become a mod in the first place? Uh, well, let's start at the beginning. I started becoming a mod from the role as uh, Paladin Studios. So I was working alongside uh, Arano, doing a lot of stuff for the community, starting out as a developer. And I was basically my introduction to Discord as a, at all because I was never using Discord. I didn't know how it worked. So it was very interesting for that. And then at that point, I was also a quality assurance. So I was working a lot with people on uh, bugs and issues they found and set that up as well, try to reproduce it so we could fix them in the future updates. And alongside Arana, I was uh, doing a lot of uh, community managing stuff and try to interact with the community and uh, get them hyped for upcoming updates. Well, basically when I stopped working at Paladin, I transformed myself into like a player mod. And now I'm just uh, a bit more chilling and trying to uh, keep the community a bit more healthy in a sense as a player. Mm -hmm. So oh, people yeah. just need to, how do you call it? Basically, you, I think you just call it like a, a healthy communication with people, no toxicity and also help uh, deciding uh, what needs to be done when people are breaking the rules, but also getting some feedback from the community, from the Discord server, and then try to come up with ways to improve what kind of channels do we want, how do we order those channels, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, the mods have been doing a pretty good job in keeping the, the community uh, healthy and welcoming because I do I, I enjoy the Discord community very, very much. Always happy to hear. <laughs> Let's move on to more Stormbound then. Stormbound! It's pretty nice to always ask what some what someone's favorite faction is. So uh, what would yours be? Well, it's so difficult. Like there are like four flavors, right? Or five if you call neutral as well. And I think <laughs> I if I really go back, I think I'm privileged as a shadow fan player. Heck just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, more shadow fan people in the podcast. Let's go. <laughs> like shadow fan is the most interesting way to play control. If I go play aggro, I think I will go with the ironclad aggro, but it's just because I want not to have swarm aggro win. So my aggro counters, tries to counter swarm aggro. 
Oh yeah, I, I see how that works. But in general, let's just go defending. And I think the confer traps you can make, how you call them, are very interesting <laughs> mechanic as well. And now with the recent uh, toxic sacrifice uh, birth, how you guys call it, I think mm -hmm. it also becomes a bit more interesting because now it becomes two mana. So it won't be an auto-include in any decks to have an easy AoE. So now you have to start coming up with uh, unit placements and set up those traps for Convert and Witches of the Wild, etc. It matters a bit more. Nice way to segue from the birth. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think of the changes that Sheepyard has made to the game? Where do you think they're trying to move the game towards? Uh, well, I really like uh, the changes they did so far, especially the balance changes. Like there are minor to do while well, you have a lot of think about like what's the impact of a balance change. But like for us, it just makes a whole new deck possible because a card costs one mana less and another card that has been OP for like forever. Like the elders were never changed since they were released until Shipyard did it. So it's like super important that those cards are finally getting a nerf. If they never get nerfed, then well, they will still be dominating the meta as we know it right now. So those things and well, if you listen to the previous podcast, then you also heard that they will uh, do more minor balance changes every month. So that's yeah, amazing. That... And that will keep mm -hmm. everything fresh. New decks will arise because certain cards become stronger, other becomes weaker. And those that, that dynamic is, I think, very important. Mm -hmm. And for the where they are going, I'm really hoping they go uh, into more first-time user experience. Like getting more people uh, engaged into Stormbound. So we have more players in all the leagues. I think that will be very healthy. And that gives also a bit more possibilities to introduce more game modes. Because right. more people, you can have more game modes because all game modes are getting played by a bunch of people at all times. So your queues won't be too long and you don't have to face bots. Yeah, for sure, uh, building the player base of the game is a really strong priority in terms of like growing the game and having more uh, options to uh, improve it. So yeah, that that that's a pretty good perspective on that. About the new changes, things like uh, new cards and features like the friendly battle. So what do you think of those? Well, the friendly battles are amazing. I haven't been trying, <laughs> uh, haven't been playing them myself yet. I'm really looking forward to do streams and then just have uh, people who are watching just challenge me on cap level 13 or uh, whatever, or 13 with base HP or level three cards, whatever rocks their boat. And then I can just uh, adapt myself because I have a large collection because now it's always an issue when I want to play with people uh, who are watching because they have to face a maxed out deck. Yeah, mm -hmm. not a lot of people have the opportunity to uh, challenge those things. Also, that's going to be super good. And the new cards... Well, I'm really interested in uh, what uh, Bisanu, uh, Bisanu, yeah, right? Oh yeah, me too. I, I think everyone is really excited for that one. It's going to be uh, pretty hype. <laughs> <laughs> everyone is, uh, you know, especially because of the previous podcast talking about the leak of the new silence mechanic. Everyone is, is really leaning towards Bis uh, Bisanu being the first card to implement uh, the silence. So uh, I guess we'll see. It could be something completely different. <laughs> yeah, but they, they already gave some hints on... Like, it was a bit like Hearthstone, right? Or did I remember it wrong? Yeah, yeah. That, that's uh, regarding the silence mechanic. Not necessarily for uh, Bisanu. All right. All right. So, you know, if people are interested in uh, joining your, your streams, which which do sound very fun. I actually had joined them um, a <laughs> <Nice>. few times. <laughs> and uh, so for people who are interested in uh, watching you stream, uh, how often do you stream? Um, well, it depends a bit. I try to stream every brawl at least. And... Well, if I'm up to it, I would stream every day, but it's sadly not possible because there are other uh, priorities in life. But uh, yeah, I try to stream multiple times a week and mostly uh, during the weeks in the evening and in the weekends, I'm a bit more flexible. Basically, every time I'm going to stream or I'm going to do my quest, I think like, I can do my quest myself on the couch or I can just uh, boot up my computer start stream and then uh, other people can uh, bump in and uh, join and we can have fun together and do my quest in the like <laughs> on the side track all right so apart from like uh because you stream on twitch correct yes and on youtube well, basically uh, yes, i stream with Reamstree, restream restream.io which gives us uh, a lot of uh, flexibility in which platforms all oh, right yeah you, you, you stream in like multiple platforms at the same time yeah, also spread out Stormbound uh, around the streaming services. 
All right. Well, if people are also interested in following you and maybe some kind of a uh, social media, is are there places where they can find you online? Uh, well, definitely. If you go on uh, YouTube and you search for MKM, like the name, how to say it, it's probably in the name of the title or whatever. <laughs> so you can find it somewhere, or you can just look it up for uh, on Twitch, and otherwise uh, join Discord, and then you will see me as a player mod there as well. So you can always uh, ping me. All right. Well, I, I hope you guys enjoyed that interview, and especially you and MKM. Thank you for having me. It's been a it's been a real pleasure having you here. It was a pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, that was fantastic, Arthas. What are your big takeaways from this? Big takeaways, honestly, it's just it's just great to see the kind of um, commitment that the community has been putting in. Like with MKM and his streams. He really does help bring in a lot of new players, especially recently in the past few weeks. I've been seeing some people uh, joining uh, MKM's Discord server and people asking about, you know, where the official Discord server is as well for Stormbound. And so we're getting new and uh, more people into the community. It's just really nice that people like himself are contributing this much and keeping the community and the content fresh. I mean, <laughs> like like what he said, it is <laughs> shame on you if you're not in the Discord because it's an amazing place to learn and make friends. And I, I definitely love it there. I basically live there. <laughs> and feel free to check out the Brute Sages. Oh, yeah, for sure. Subsection there where we can talk about this podcast and continue the discussions we start here. Oh, that's actually a really good point. It's a, a wonderful new channel they gave us in the oh, yeah. official Discord this week. I forgot to mention that. Thank you for bringing it up, Subaiko. All right, Arthas, continue, please. Uh, I mean, there is also like things like the Stormbound Reddit thread, but that still needs a lot more work. It's definitely not as flushed and as welcoming as the Discord. So I really, really, really recommend join the Discord. It's free. Guys, it's free. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you got everything to gain. You can always leave if you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and and Subaiko, what were your takeaways from the interview? You know, one thing that as a newer player to the game, it was great to hear was the uh, the history of the balance changes and the fact that you can go onto Stormbound Kitty and take a look at some of the ways that the cards used to be and uh, compare that to how they are now. And that really gives you an idea of what's powerful in the game and what, what maybe used to be too strong. And if you compare that to what you're looking at now, it gives you, it gives you a really good idea of what cards are still very good to play. You mean you mean like the broken gift of the wise that currently just gives you a boatload of mana, but oh hey, used to also draw you two cards at max yeah. level. <laughs> and the Crazy. fact that it still had to be changed a couple of months ago let, lets you know just how powerful that mana acceleration can be. I, I'm going to drop a little shameless plug here and say I think it should maybe still get nerfed. Yeah. Maybe one more time. Anyway, we'll, we'll discuss that in a little bit. My um, my big takeaway from it was, uh, I know Sheepyard is committed to growing this game, and I applaud that. Um, based on our two interviews so far with MKM and Bujosa, may I humbly suggest that they simply leave a job opening posted online all the time. <laughs> 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 people seem to get introduced to this game not just not just people but but dedicated players who've put you know in, in mkm's situation what two three four years almost into this game all from a job opening so uh yeah let's do that yeah that's definitely the way to get a larger player base mm -hmm. yeah, one by one <laughs> <laughs> Hire them all. All right. So moving on from there, MKM talked about how the balance changes have been helping to keep the meta fresh. He's happy to see things being modified again and hopefully on a monthly basis, just again for that freshness. We talked a lot last week about the specific cards in the current balance changes, but we didn't really talk about the like overall uh, state of the balance in the game. So why don't we dive in a little bit? Which of the cards are currently really good and really bad overall? And see if we can't come up with some reasons why and, um, you know, try to give some of our listeners maybe some guidance as to where they should be putting their resources, for example. Uh, and if we can, maybe even try to give an overall picture for someone who's trying to make a decision like, I don't know, should I invest in Shadowfan? Should I invest in Ironclad? Where should I go? Maybe we can give some ideas about currently where are each of the four factions and uh, what styles of play in those factions are really viable. Right. So I want to get into, firstly, one of the cards that have been impacted the most. And it wasn't even from the, the most recent patch. It was from a previous one. But uh, Hunter's Vengeance, that card... Mm. 
Oh my gosh, it has infested the meta. <laughs> it, it's um, it's it's everywhere because of it being a neutral card and not just that a cheap, strong AOE control card. It's just crazy how how often I'm seeing it and how powerful it really is. Being able to delete any cards that are six or less strength. So that's basically the meta so far <laughs> 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 for two mana. For two mana, right? And then like it also synergizes well with elders. So it's like mm. amazing. And like I gotta say, yeah, I know I said I was like really excited with the whole uh toxic sacrifice birth, you know, with the six damage now. Mm-hmm. But uh <laughs> literally, dude, Hunter's Vengeance is just better toxic now. No. I've been seeing Swarm Rush decks play Hunter's Vengeance just as a way to uh, mitigate the opponent's incoming damage and then just play their all their cards afterward. And you know, they're still playing out their whole hand on seven mana, but you know, it's just one of those cards is defensive. It buys them the time that they need to, to just get there. Yeah, I mean, uh, given, given the chances you are to draw a particular card in your starting turn, if you're a second player, you have a 5 out of 12 chance to just wipe the enemy's front line as second player while also playing another Ooh, card it's just ridiculous point. it's ridiculous uh but 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 boys and girls at home please remember order lol <laughs> yeah. yeah i will i will agree with you that hunter's vengeance is just uh very popular for good reason it's it's something that now i consciously try to play around and start thinking to myself hey i've already got one toad on the board let's try to make some more instead of you know instead of dropping knights and felines or whatever it's interesting you mention that because uh I, I haven't been playing a ton of ladder but the amount of ladder i have been playing over the last you know because again this wasn't a a buff that happened um just this past month, it was the previous month. Um, I have seen a lot more Seder dedicated swarm decks, and of course, obviously, a lot of construct uh, focused ironclad. Um, and I'm wondering if some of the decision of swarm players to go heavy on the single race satyrs isn't in response to the prevalence of Hunter's Vengeance in the meta. You know, that's a really good point because the cheap neutral cards that are in most decks, looking specifically at green prototypes. Types, gifted recruits, wild saber paws, lawless hurt. You know, the one thing that you can say is that they are all of different factions. So Hunter's Vengeance is automatically very good against a lot of rush decks, simply yeah. because they're playing the good rush cards uh, by being able to take advantage of the uh, faction specific synergy. You can kind of mitigate that a little bit. Speaking of faction specific synergy, uh, Link Golems is still stupid good. <laughs> it really is. It really is. So, so the one thing I I have not liked in card games has been early swing turns. I, I I love swing turns. They add a lot of drama to the game. You don't know how the game's really going to end up because you don't know if your opponent's going to be able to make that swing turn or not. Conversely, if you're behind and you're like, oh man, this next draw could be it. I could get my swing turn right here and we could turn the board in our favor. The problem I have is just linked golems happens too early in the game. And when swing turns happen early in the game, they tend to cause snowball effects Mm -hmm. that, um, create disparate outcomes that feel effectively decided at that point. And what I mean by that is I don't have the stats, but I would bet a nice bottle of bourbon that the overall win percentage of ironclad being played that has linked golems in the deck, the overall win percentage I'm going to guess is at least 10 percentage points higher when linked golems are played and procced on curve. Yeah, when it's that crazy ha- because... Right, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say when that happens, their chances of winning just jumped astronomically. Go right ahead. Yeah, because like let's say it happens to like four mana or five mana. Because it's either green protos link golems or destructive bots link golems. When you do get that like synergy off, you have two large boys to deal with. I mean link golems themselves at max level would be like eight strength. That's like at least two strength higher than most of the meta cheap cards, right? Because cheap cards are usually six or five strength. So mm-hmm. you need to like dedicate like usually two cards to deal with just one of the two chonky boys, right? <laughs> and not just that. If it was if it was procked in the early game, right? The enemy also has not that much mana to deal with that kind of ridiculous value. Right. That's what that's why the 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 
win percentage swing I think is so big is because it's happening earlier than your opponents have the ability to really respond to. And so it just from there, it, everything gets easier. You don't have to fight to maintain your front. Your front's going to progress each turn because it's there's two, like you said, two chunky boys on the board. Uh-oh. Uh, you know, your opponent can't afford to turn an entire hand into those cards, but that's what they would have to do, right? Three cards played on turn like five or six would all need to dump into them. Otherwise, how do you clear it? Luckily, I mean, as a Shadowfin player, <laughs> it's a little <laughs> it's a little more uh, tolerable, manageable when you have something as amazing as witches. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And especially because linked golems have movement, they almost always invariably create a nice board for witches to react into for sure exactly. that's the best response in the game and there's two other factions scratching their heads saying oh wait guys we're here too yeah i mean there's there's so much emphasis on the first turn like let's say you're battling against ironclad and you're first player and let's say you can play two cards like green protos and like saber like mm-hmm. you really really need to like separate those two units that you're gonna play so that they don't get too much value with the link golem's turn like always assume they have a link golem's turn at the start because like almost all the time they have it like the chances are actually pretty high to get it in the first or second turn yep and playing around it is really the only way you can keep up yeah it's rough. I, 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 I love the card. I love the effect. I love that it forces you to want to play a certain style of deck that I think is very neat. I just don't like that it's such a big power spike on such an early turn. And not for nothing, having played a lot of Ironclad, not a ton, but a lot, I would have to say that it really hurts because I agree with you. Your your chances are better than 50-50 that you're going to have it on opener. But when you don't... <laughs> You feel like the world's worst ironclad play. Like it's 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 not healthy for either side, right? It feels terrible when your opponent does it to you so early you can't respond. And it feels terrible when you can't do it as the ironclad player because so much of your win condition relies on that early value drop. Moving on from there, Sabaiku, give me another thought on the meta. Well, I wanted to talk about another card that creates big swing turns, although admittedly not as early in the game. And I originally was thinking that Gift of the Wise is what I wanted to talk about because the mana acceleration really is still very good. But then I use card draw, though. I'm just thinking. (laughs) Yeah, we should look into that. Uh, But then I realized the problem that I have when I play against Winter really is not when I see Gift of the Wise on 8. It's really when I see a level 4 Arcshuid Aaron on 7 mana. Mm. Now, they're cheating out not just a few extra mana from the Gift of the Wise, they're cheating out a bunch of extra mana from Gift of the Wise and another spell along with it. You play up to 14 mana worth of spells for free, along with a pretty decent-sized body. You know, uh, I think the level 4 is 11 strength, um, and that on its own is hard to deal with. And then and if it plays something like Needle Blast or Blade Storm or Gift of the Wise, and then there's more cards in hand that can follow. Like Freebooters? If one of those is Freebooters, yeah. then you can basically just concede right there. It's such an <laughs> overwhelming s- swing turn a lot of the time. And unfortunately, you just can't really deal with it other than trying to put 17 damage into the opponent before they have seven mana. Like that's not that's not really viable most of the time. Yeah, and um, I mean, I've been having a lot of experience with uh, Eren because I recently got her to level 4. Ooh. And yeah, it's actually incredibly busted how how much just simply Eren Gift of the Wise is. Like, you don't even need other spells to get that kind of value. Because like, I like max level, Eren Gift of the Wise, you can play things like Ulf and Ubes, <laughs> right? Like, it's it's just, it's crazy how much you can do. Like me, sometimes when I when I really want to go ham on, a, on the Eren turn, like I would be able to play Crazy Bombers and Twilight prowlers and they have just no hope to deal with uh like after i just cleared them now they have like three large bodies to deal with (laughs) it's just it's just crazy and then like another thing i noticed is that you know with all the recent patches like there's been a lot of spell buffs actually in the most in the series of patches like execution buff 
now mm -hmm. like eight damage confinement now three mana yeah. blade yeah. storm yeah. four damage at level five like all of these like spell buffs have have really made uh like even dark harvest right like have really made the Aaron a very appealing choice and especially because winter basically only uses Aaron now right and basically that's the only way that the class is really seeing a lot of play mm -hmm. and any sort of success which just tells you how how busted that card is yeah this is exactly uh the kind of thing we we discussed this uh, i want to say in episode one the beginning uh the discussion around how mana cheat can constrict design space the problem is if winter was given good defensive spells additional to what they already have it would just be overpowering because of Aaron. you would play gift of the wise and whatever that good defensive spell is and holy smokes like not for nothing your opponent if they can have Aaron on turn uh the game's over and so winter doesn't get the other kind of control tools and and uh spells it needs because Aaron's there uh especially level four it, it, I mean, it's one it's one thing to cheat out a card from hand. It's another thing for that card to be mana gain. But then when you also allow them to do that plus an AOE in a, you know, in a, in a world where freebooters exist, it's just it's such a confounding set of cards to have available at the same time in the meta. I, I wonder if one of them should go away. Like, for example, and I know this sounds stupid, but just hear me out for a second. Aaron giving you Gift of the Wise and let's say Blade Storm, for example, max level. Nuts, right? But Without freebooters, you only have one other card in your hand. Mm -hmm. yep. It's really difficult to curate your hand with for the first you know three four turns, such as you have the exact perfect set of four cards in your hand because Aaron only plays from hand. I want to comment on this. Go right ahead. Because I have been practicing and perfecting the the Aaron playstyle, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna tell you with enough practice. You can almost always get an absurd Aaron Gift of the Wise turn. Oh, for sure. How often? When you have the kind of crazy cycle knowledge that I have, <laughs> <laughs> like you don't even need freebooters, okay? Really? What, what do you want? Yeah, no, you know why? Let mm. me just tell you how freaking busted it really is. You don't need to play other spells other than Gift of the Wise. All you need is Aaron, Gift of the Wise, a large eight or nine mana card, and then any other card. It can be anything. So you don't even think that Aaron at level four is required then? You it's think not. That it really isn't. It really isn't. Simply Aaron Gift to the Wise. Yeah, but you want Gift to be like level four. Sure. Yeah, I guess Gift being like a relatively high level, like a decent level to be playing at the rank. Like level four itself is, yeah, that, that's good. Level five is crazy. Sure. But uh, yeah, you, you just being able to play a really large eight or nine mana card, like me, I've been playing Siren, Ulf, or Crazy Bomber, and then have anything else like maybe Gifted or like Ubus, right? Man, you got to send me that deck list. I gotta show yes. you, dude. I've been, I've been, I've been really uh, perfecting this one because I've, I've been optimizing like how to cycle for it. Like, what happens if you end up getting Aaron and Gift of the Wise first turn? It's a lot more. It's a lot harder because it's harder to cycle because you want to keep those two cards. But let me just say, you don't want to play other spells with Aaron. You just want to play Gift of the Wise. If you do end up playing other spells, what you do want is uh, freebooters. But again, takes a lot of cycling practice. But with practice, I I can guarantee you, it's very very manageable. It sounds to me like we need to have a total Brood Sages team stream at some point in the near future where we uh you, you show us this magic. Yeah, I sign up for that lecture. I I'm very excited. <laughs> it's it, it's it's actually I'll show you how simple it is. It's crazy. It's too strong. Yeah, I, I will say this for for our listeners out there. Um, there are a lot of people who will yell and scream about how Swarm Rush, maybe not right now, but how you know in the spring Swarm Rush was like this brain dead, mindless way of playing. And I tried to play it and tried to play it, and I understood like how the cards work, but heavens knows, like I could not get a good win streak going until I sat with Reckless and he taught me about the importance of cycling. It's not just playing the cards in hand, it's playing the deck and lining it up as such so that the right cards are there for you at the right time. So, you know, for all of you out there thinking, oh yeah, it's easy. You just get Aaron, you get Gift of the Wise and magic happens. Mm, no. no. Some some work goes in to set that up for sure. Well, I want to, I want to do, I do want to suggest a potential change that I think would actually fix this problem. Ooh, Okay. Not necessarily fix, but drastically fix. <laughs> you know, like a pretty good improvement. It's uh for Aaron decks 
and I find this to be a really interesting, ironic parallel. Aaron decks are usually extremely heavy, especially when you have a uh, gift of the wise. Mm -hmm. So um, you want to be able to stall in the early game to get that seven mana Aaron gift of the wise turn. And as soon as that happens, you basically win, right? But you have to stall. And I mean, there are times where I do get like rushed but before then. Like they keep base locking me. Even if I play Aaron Gift of the Wise, I have no spots to play left. Like sometimes that happens. But uh, I think it's funny that it's kind of the same as like rush where you also want to be a bit lucky in the early game. And then if you do get lucky in the early game, you basically win. I think it's funny that a rush and that heavy deck have that sort of like parallel. But anyway, regarding my proposal, because of how important it is to survive up to seven mana, I think is going to be extremely hard to pull off if Aaron was 8 mana. Ooh. One turn is massive. It's so big of a change on the board. Because one, I mean, one mana difference, not only is it one turn for you, but it's also one turn for the enemy. Two turns that are going to mm -hmm. be happening before you get to play your ideal Aaron. And also, Aaron now won't be able to abuse the absurd mana gain from Gift of the Wise, because now they're both 8 mana. Right, it's just a free, it's a free unit. Right. It would definitely be a drastic change for sure. Another option would be to limit the spells that she could play and maybe have it be something like you can, split, can play two spells up to five mana, up to six mana, something like that. So you can't abuse the mana acceleration. With oh yeah, that, that, one's, that one's a good one too. Yeah, I like, I like both of those ideas, in fact. All right, so moving on from there, those are some of the more powerful cards that we're dealing with in the uh, meta right now. How about some of the cards that were, maybe they were seeing play and are seeing less or maybe they were never seeing play and now they're still not seeing play <laughs> what's missing guys what, what's out there that that uh, you you'd like to uh, give a shout out to and say hey we'd love to see this card at some point so Baiku, give me something well i don't know if necessarily this is a we'd love to see this card kind of thought but oh, the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about bad cards is uh, some of the vanilla cards that are just getting overwhelmed by power creep. Some of the cards that have been recently buffed just just fill that role and do it better. Uh, something we talked about earlier was uh, Terrific Slayers now being Warfront Runners, but with a bonus. If you have them at equivalent level, they're equivalent strength, but Terrific Slayers also does some damage to dragons if your opponent happens to be running them. Uh, or Fluffy Bad Boxers is now just stronger than Heroic Soldiers. And I understand that there is a rarity discrepancy there. The two knights are commons and the cards that are replacing them are rares. But I don't think that a rare should be the same thing as a common but better. I think that's bad for the game in general and just drives up the cost of playing more than anything else. I think that's really fair. Arthas, give me something. Well, to add to that, uh, I remember, I think Berzoza, uh like gave a small leak about this, but they are thinking about, I don't remember what the word he used. It was either like rework or tweak. I, th I think, I think, it, yeah, I think it was tweak. Tweak, Warfront Runners, and Heroic Soldiers. I'm really curious what they're going to do with vanilla cards. I never thought they would change vanilla cards. I thought they would at least change the uh, the other cards that have abilities. But I mean, Four mana Heroic Soldiers, make it happen. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> that, that might be a little too much, but I, I agree with it. Like The vanilla card should be the base that you it then build the everything yeah. else around when everything else is basically vanilla but better than the vanilla cards just don't don't feel good it feels like they're just taking up room in your collection mm -hmm. what about so so we were in the meta as uh uh actually mkm pointed out the elders never got nerfed and so we were in the elder meta this spring right um but Saying that sort of ignores the fact that there were a whole bunch of elders that weren't seeing play. Uh, and maybe, I don't know, maybe there was the possibility that they would find some space for them now. But um, I don't know. Has anyone seen a Trekking Alderman? I, uh, I, I've seen one. Crunchy Bones. <laughs> oh, yes, that guy. That guy, Crunchy Bones. He was trying to do some kind of potion of growth type shenanigans with Trekking Alderman. And then he Ooh. saw my Aaron and he conceded. He did this, <laughs> he did this twice in a row. Dude, Trekking Alderman <laughs> is one that I see in the brawl. In the Elder Brawl, I see Trekking Alderman and I know yeah. I'm going to win that game. <laughs> it's not even good in that brawl. <laughs> so I will say that um, uh, I, I often get the command units forward daily quest. 
and I don't play petrified fossils in the deck I make for it. <laughs> oh my god, petrified fossils, that thing. <laughs> it's such a meme. I feel like it's it's right like I, I feel like the mechanic is right for swarm though. It's an elder, it it's like a cool, you know, build off of the mechanics that were already there. I don't know why it doesn't work, but it just it, it good gracious it does not. To cite the weekly card competitions, that some of the criteria they use to judge cards is uh not only like the concept and design, like how good they are to fit the theme and the game of Stormbound, but there's also the balance. Um, although Petrified Fossils like really fits the swarm theme, it's, uh, the balance, the balance portion of the card is just. It might be that it's not strong enough, but I think that the problem is isn't the strength of the unit the problem is you don't always want to command all of your units forward you lose the control of which units you push and when you push them Mm, that's a good point that really messes up your positioning and if you're playing some sort of rush deck then the positioning is really important if you if you push the wrong units forward it's too easy to clear your front you need more on the board and that's why you can't just slotted in at, at five mana on a rush deck and think that you're going to win you're much better off having forgotten souls because it costs a lot less two mana is very important in that in that style of deck and you have more control over which units move and i think that's really the critical part of it i think that's why the card was a miss yeah that's a very good point well with this in mind um <laughs> We've been talking about powerful individual cards tonight. Um, We're going to be expanding that conversation into our next episode, uh, uh, thinking about how to play powerful decks. Um, We're working on something right now that we're hoping to bring you uh, next time around. It's going to be an analysis of which decks are most frequently played on ladder. And um, we even have some ideas on how to bring you a uh, independent evaluation on which of those decks are the strongest right now in the game. Um, We're very excited about it. We don't want to tell you too much tonight, but um, we just want to uh, give a little shameless plug to it right now and also just let you know that, uh, you know, for those of you who are struggling on ladder to hopefully, uh, you know, reach new heights that you've never reached before, we want to be uh, a a small help if we can. We're dedicated to trying to help uh, your experience in Stormbound be better. Uh, And this is one way that we've come up with that hopefully we can do that. So uh, look for that in the next episode. It may I even have a web page with some information on it. If we can get this right, please knock on wood for us. This is a first attempt for us. And you can just go back and listen to our old episodes to know how first attempts normally go. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, So for Arthas, Vaiku, I am Freeloader, and we are the Brood Sages reminding you, please follow us uh, on Twitter at Brood Sages. And you can always email us at thebroodsages at gmail.com. And until next time, stay hydrated.